of our mouth, the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. St. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. We are comforted and confronted today by our Lord's summary of the law. I say confronted because we would be wise not to reduce this familiar formula we say every week into one more motivational quote or yearbook caption neutered for our easy consumption. One of the worst examples of this gelding of the word of God I ever heard was from a young woman who celebrated her graduation from a local law school by quoting John 19.30. It is finished. I have never attended law school, but if it is anything like seminary, I imagine there are moments that might feel a bit like crucifixion. But surely, anyone who understands the enormity of what Christ did at Calvary in AD 33 would be disinclined to compare their struggles with tough professors and late night study sessions to the unendurable suffering taken on by Jesus for the sake of the world. But we see examples of this all the time. The inward turn perspective of my young lawyer friend only makes sense if we elevate our own experience over the true story we find in Scripture. My story becomes the important one, and this whole Christ story becomes the dressing or green bean casserole around me, the turkey. This conception of ourselves as the star of the show, the main character of the drama of the earth, the lover and the loved, is a distinctly modern one and is only really possible in the disconnected individualistic world we have been building for the last 300 years. It should be no surprise that we face a suicide and drug epidemic in this lonely little world where I am instructed to be my own best friend, my own lover, and my own God. And make no mistake, any time we move Christ from being the love we desire, the identity that gives us meaning, and the known truth by which we evaluate all else, whenever we make that familiar slide back into the comforting current of a dying world, we make ourselves the lonely kings of an empty kingdom. And as Jesus says over and over and over again, there is only room for one kingdom in the new world to come. God is either the center of our life, the ultimate desire of our heart, or he is our enemy. It should be no surprise that so much pain and suffering and regret flow from a people who have made love their enemy. It is that perspective that we should carry with us as we witness our old friends, the Pharisees, interrogating Jesus in today's gospel. We are not outsiders with popcorn watching a movie about some character named Jesus, mining his timeless truths to get us through another day. Nor are we religious spectators hearing a lesson made stale by how many times we've heard it and by always assuming we're the good guys in the story. Jesus is making his last stand surrounded by the failed architecture of the human religious project. He sits in a temple completed by the bloody King Herod who murdered his own family members to preserve his puppet reign as 
king of Judea under the emperor. He's surrounded by a religious leadership who prefer to whore themselves out to the Roman Empire rather than fall down and worship the true king, the true dwelling place of God that stood before them. Just as Jesus faced the barbed questions of Satan in the wilderness, Jesus faces the questions of humanity in the ill-stewarded, falling-down wilderness of a temple made just as wild as the garden Adam failed to keep holy. The Sadducees and Pharisees are the ones asking questions, but it is humanity that is on trial. The stakes could not be higher for them or for us. So right before our reading today, Jesus had just finished silencing the Sadducees. The Greek is great here. It's like muzzled the Sadducees. Who, uh, the Sadducees were trying to make Jesus look foolish by exposing his silly belief in the resurrection of the dead. After all, up-to-date first-century people didn't believe in such nonsense. It's the 30s for crying out loud. Sorry. Jesus, however, not only deftly defends the future resurrection of the dead, he establishes and insists that it is impossible to be part of the people of God, to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob without believing in the resurrection of the dead. They do not mix. Much more could be said on this, but let's move on to today's controversy. The Pharisees have brought a ringer to challenge Jesus in front of the disciples and crowds that have gathered around to see him teach. This lawyer is an expert in the Torah, sort of like a canon lawyer, the 613 commandments that make up the law. And this lawyer's goal is to make Jesus say something that could be used in a blasphemy trial later, and also just to make him look foolish in front of all these people. He's, in a sense, trying to make God bleed. The question, teacher, which is the great commandment of the law, is a difficult one. But Jesus answers in a way that reveals so much about the relationship between Christians and the law. Firstly, the familiar words of Jesus are not taken from folk wisdom or just made up off the top of his head in the moment. No. Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18. After all, the whole Bible is the word of God. And Jesus can freely use the previous revelations of the Godhead to clarify and to instruct. Jesus is the great law giver. And St. Matthew is at pains over and over again to show that Jesus establishes a mediated continuity between the Old and the New Testament. We see this in action when Jesus discusses sins like lust and divorce in the Sermon on the Mount. It is worth noting that revisionist theologians and their loyal disciples like to defend their affirmative positions on a whole host of things like homosexual acts or the much, much more widespread fornication, they like to reference this verse and say something like, we're just about loving our neighbor. However, these snake oil salesmen are only able to get away with this type of interpretive malfeasance, this violence to the text. They're only able to get away with this because Americans don't read their Bibles. We, we admit to this in polls all the time. We, if we did, we would know Jesus is quoting from Leviticus, a book that is quite clear on the abominable nature of using our bodies outside of God's design. You literally can't get love thy neighbor without that love being shaped and defined by the God who ruled both in Leviticus and in the book of Matthew. Because a love detached from God becomes just one more declaration of the lonely king screaming edicts to himself. And who cares? 
Which brings us to the importance of the first and great commandment and the second that is like unto it. We see that the divine will for human existence is to love. Now, of course, the object and animating force of our love matters, but it is a staggering and wonderful and amazing revelation that it isn't power or violence or possessions or security that are to be the direction and focus of the well-lived life. No. We are set free from the crushing demands of a world that enslaves us by making these other aspects of human life supreme. Jesus, sitting among the men who will cheer and laugh at his torture and death, tells these men that God wills that they love him and their neighbor. It's unthinkable. How much are we to love God? Jesus commands that we love God with everything we have. There is no safe space for the demands of the living God. There is no place to hide from his ever-searching gaze, just as there is no place to hide from his all-encompassing love. They're together. As modern 21st century Westerners, do we believe that? Do we have secret places we can hide from God? With all due respect to Baudelaire, the great lie the devil told our forebears was that we could buy God and own him, or treat him like a cause, or a hobby, or a club. No, a thousand times now, that cannot be how we love God with the entirety of our heart, soul, and mind. Our chief privilege, we hear from the mouth of Jesus, is the adoration of God. And beautifully and naturally, that flows right into the second commandment, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Because it is our neighbor that we find the ever-present opportunity to love an immortal person made in the image and likeness of the God we're supposed to love. To paraphrase C.S. Lewis, next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the closest thing to God your senses will encounter. Or, as St. John tells us, a little bit more bluntly, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. 1 St. John 4, 20 through 21. These two commandments are inseparable. And an overemphasis on one or the attempt to delink one from the other is how we always get into trouble. So, two commandments. That doesn't sound very hard. But of course, we should not deceive ourselves, as St. Paul always likes to say, don't deceive yourselves. When faced with these two commandments, we should not come away with any sense that we are doing a good job of keeping them. In fact, the more we hold our lives up against the piercing light of its beautiful simplicity, we begin to realize that far from loving God and loving neighbor, we have much more often succumbed to the evergreen allure of loving ourselves. We hear it all the time. You have to love yourself first before you can love anyone else. People say this like it was delivered to them on golden tablets, when in fact it is nothing more than self-righteous garbage a form of idolatry that replaces God as the center of our love and makes us the new God. And we are cruel and demanding gods. For just as it is brutal and terrible for people to tell others to look for ultimate happiness in the arms of a human lover, 
who is just as screwed up and fallen and in need of salvation as we are. It is evil and cruel to tell people that they will be happy if they could only find some way to love themselves, whatever that actually means in practice. Our modern therapeutic age changes the great commandment, this beautiful, wonderful summary of the will of God into love yourself with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbor as long as it doesn't interfere too much with loving yourself. For in the closed circle of the love affair with ourselves, there is no way to break out and really love anyone else. And so our relationships can too easily simply become new ways to experience self-love. I'm in this for myself. Rather than being conduits to which we can experience the divine language of the universe by sharing the love of the Godhead. A love for which the world was created. It's why we're here. A love that transcends even death. Show me how a love separated from God can transcend death. Our loved ones die. Our memories fade. Our keepsakes decay. There is no hope in those things. Without God, love can be beautiful, but it is always tragic. But thankfully, when we find our Pharisees here, staring down their Creator, we have to recognize that there was plenty of love in their hearts, plenty of this tragic love in their questions and in their hostility. It was simply the love of self, the idolatry of I. How often have we been right there with them? But thankfully, we are not saved by our ability to keep this law. No. That is why we beg for mercy every Sunday after the priest declares its authority over us. Lord, have mercy. We are saved by that man we are asking to get mercy from. We are saved by the only man who ever actually lived these commandments in their beauty and rigor. The life, ministry, trial, and death of Jesus Christ are the greatest moments in the history of human love. It is only in these times, it is the only time, that these commandments were ever perfectly lived out on the stage of human experience. All other attempts to love God and man must be measured against the innocent Lamb of God, allowing his own creation to murder him in our greatest act of self-loving idolatry. Again, there was plenty of tragic love in the hearts of the callous men and women yelling, crucify him, crucify him. But it was the constricting self-love that makes men proud and cheerful sinners. When we recognize that this same self-love still resides in the darkened chambers of our hearts, we begin to realize the enormity of the Trinity's salvation project. We begin to realize how much we need the sacrificial love of Jesus to be our only template for what true love looks like. We begin to realize that we don't just need something called love in our lives. No. We need God to reach into our chests and pump our dead hearts back into life so that we can even be the faintest echoes of this reverberating triumph, love won forever on the cross. And when those faint echoes come together to worship in this building and live every moment for Christ when we leave, 
Our combined voices resound in the court of heaven and terrorize the pit of hell. Our love makes the evil one tremble and know that he has but a short time. So then, let us love God and neighbor and thank Christ every day for showing us that true love is always in the shape of the cross. In the name of the Father, 